Uh, you know what? No, I think we can transition straight to Philip. If I, it, it seems like if I'm pausing, I'm going to die. <laughs> At seven yeah. o'clock in the morning, you're allowed to die. <laughs> hey, we've been going all night. Uh, we got about <laughs> an hour of sleep, um, just kind of intermittent there. And um, who do we have? Do we got Mike back? No, you've got Philip. You've got, got Philip. Philip. Good, okay. good morning, folks. Well, good morning to you, sir. And I think it's safe to say that you're um, the only MBE that we have on the show. So I think for people to understand where you're coming from, which is not, I would say, true InfoSec, um, uh, give us an introduction. Hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, not true into, uh, InfoSec is, is, is a good one. I'm sort of an interloper, I think. Um, my background, I'm ex-military. I was in the British Army for uh, 26 years. Um, and that's where I was very fortunate to have collected enough um, cereal packet tops um, to uh, get them submitted and, uh, and, and be given uh, the badge, the, the award. No, I, I, I jest. Uh, very, uh, very fortunate to be uh, awarded the MBE, which for those who aren't from the UK, it is uh, a member of the Order of the British Empire. That uh, is an award that is bestowed by Her Majesty the Queen for um, having done something um, that makes you stand out and her just turn around and decide that you get an award. And, and for me, it was as part of a NATO planning team uh, taking over from the United Nations going into Bosnia. Um, mm -hmm. I, was a, I was a military intelligence officer and, and here's where the InfoSec link sort of comes in. Um, and part of my responsibility in that was uh, providing overall security and security policy for different places that I was in. Um, and part of that security policy was the wider infosec and cyber security policy and, and, and policing that as part of a wider threat fleet um, that there was that's out there. So I, I do have a little bit of um, infosec credibility from a practitioner's perspective, um, but um, I, I was at a level where I was really just a, a policy setter and had lots of people to do all the detailed work for me. Which Understood. Was great. So, but I mean, having said that, you are a favorite of uh, Kate and Davy Winder for commentary. And I think, you know, you've really shown uh, that you're taking um, a, a, a view of the nation state activity out there and terrorism and counterterrorism uh, and commenting publicly about it. Yeah. Uh, with with great comments comes great responsibility. Are, are you sort of seeing an evolution of the threat actor? Um, I, I am, and, and how I've got into that, since leaving the military, I've sort of fallen into journalism. So I, I, I write and report about it. And um, yeah. you know, the, the infosec threat, I, I, look, I look at all threats equally, um, and, and the wider cyber threat uh, and, and, and um, infosec threat is out there. And it's, it's something I um, monitor very, very closely so that I can comment on um, depending on what's out there. And it, it is morphing, it is changing. Um, the, 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 and I think we're actually missing a lot of it. Um, the, the, the lower level threats are the same. You know, they're they're, they're um, hacktivists, the, the script kids, the, um, the, the criminals that are out there. There's this new wave developing all the time of them trying to steal your money. The, the thing that concerns me, and you've mentioned it there most, is um, the, the development of uh, the nation state um, and the levels that the nation state will go down to um, uh, is something that I don't think many people realize. You know, everyone thinks that a nation state is going to focus on another nation state and its big targets and um, it's for espionage, it's for spying, it's for everything else. Um, a lot of people don't realize that nation states will actually target individuals. Um, nation states are developing um, capabilities that are out there that um, they're getting kids to use to spy on their behalf. Um, and nation states are using proxies um, uh, to use, uh, you know, to carry out a lot of their activities so that they've got an element of plausible deniability. And with the nation state actor, one of the big issues is in, in warfare terms, there are um, sort of four environments. There's land, air, maritime, and space. Right. And each of those four environments are controlled by either the Geneva Protocols or the Outer Space Treaty of 1969. Mm -hmm. The fifth environment is cyberspace. Right. There's no international regulation whatsoever. Uh, yeah, no and I mean, it's been controversial because the Talon manuals and its second yep. printing 
the International Committee of the Red Cross issued a paper on the use of cyber weapons, but you're absolutely correct in that there is, I think, a lot of governance and rhetoric. I, I was really concerned when, um, you know, uh, a member uh, uh, of parliament in the UK uh, suggested that um, a cyber attack could result in a kinetic response. But then I thought about that and I went, wait a second, uh, if cyber could actually cause a mass casualty incident, then a kinetic response might be an appropriate response. What are your thoughts on that? Well, we, we talk about cyber, we talk about it as if it's something completely different. I'm holding up um, my um, index finger on my right hand at the minute. Okay. That, that, that's, that's a digit. That right. is the biggest digital problem that there is that's out there because um, it has to click something, it has to push a button. Um, mm -hmm. the, you, the, uh, something that we talk about in cyber starts in the physical world and ends up with a reaction in the physical world. And that reaction could be um, a kinetic effect coming back against someone, or it could be um, a kinetic effect through you know, a, a, a control system and a dam being interrupted and the floodgates being opened. Um, that, that, that causes a bit of a physical effect. That, mm -hmm. that, that, and, and therefore, you know, it, in cases, it would be very appropriate that there is a, a physical response. And I think it's only a matter of time um, uh, and I'm, I'm racking my brains because I've, I think I read a, uh, an incident where there was a physical response in um, Syria to a cyber um, a cyber incident. Well, there was uh, Hamas, uh, Hamas operatives that were uh, allegedly preparing a cyber attack. Yep. Uh, got killed by the Israelis. That's right. They blew that's, up the building, right? That's 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 the one I was thinking of. It's, it's, yeah. it's too early in the morning. But but <laughs> but, but also um, the um, uh, so-called ISIS had an organization called the United Cyber Caliphate. The United yep. Caliphate um, was out there to carry out cyber attacks and, and other bits and pieces. The head of the United Cyber Caliphate just after he was asking um, uh, an individual who um, I happen to know um, uh, to try and help. Uh, developed some training material for what they were doing. Um, a, a couple of days after he had put that request in, um, his um, uh, cyber security wasn't good enough and a 500 pound bomb ended up in this cyber cafe that um, he was sitting in at that time. In the United Indeed. Cyber, the United Cyber Caliphate disappeared. So at, at the moment, we're seeing physical um, effects on uh, activity that's going on in cyberspace and you know, from an espionage perspective you, we, we, we've always had that from a policing perspective we've always had that you know the script kitty sitting in his room hacking into the bank um mm -hmm. it will tend to result in a physical effect of the police kicking his door down and coming in um, <laughs> taking away for, for a little bit of questioning yeah so you know, the, the 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 two in, uh, worlds are completely linked um and it's wrong with people to try and i think from a wider security perspective to try and separate cyberspace out as something completely different. We have to think of everything holistically, um, and the more the more times we think of it holistically, then you, you can you can look at um, dealing with the potential threats that are out there, dealing with potential threat actors, and understanding how it's going to impact on you and your organisation. Those are all really great points, and I think you're absolutely right that it that it's interlinked. And it, it is something that is not easily deconstructed. I want to talk a little bit, uh, though, about your transition from military service to civilian. Yeah. And, and uh, so there are a lot of folks um, contemplating making the move, coming out of the military and moving into civilian practice. What advice would you give them? What 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 did you discover on that journey that they might benefit from? Well, I, I went through the journey in, in a slightly painful way because I came out of the military not realizing that I was suffering quite badly from PTSD. Um, and it took me a number of years before I got to position and um, got properly diagnosed and treated. Um, the, the, the transition, um, it's not as difficult as people think. It's it's trying to understand that um, all you're doing is going into an environment where um, there's, there's two things. People are talking a different language. Mm -hmm. And generally in civilian life, um, people don't care. Right. That, 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 sound, that sounds a little cruel. People are, the military is all about teamwork. Um, mm -hmm. if, you, if you don't work as a team, 
you don't work as a team all of the time and, and all of the training, all of the environment, everything else is built around um, your mates looking after you, um, people doing things automatically um, to help you because you know, that should be what's going on. That's, that's the environment. It doesn't always happen like that. But um, when, uh, what I found um, going into civilian business and all the rest of it is that um, certainly in, in business terms, most people are out for number one. And that's quite hard to get used to. Um, and, and the motivation is not there from a team perspective. You get some exceptional companies, you get some exceptional groups of people uh, who, who buck the trend. Um, but um, you know, I, I got out and went into the steel industry um, as a sales and marketing director um, and uh, to, to learn about business stuff, nothing to do with the military. Um, mm -hmm. And um, you certainly find that uh, that you know, at every turn I was having to watch my back. You know, I, I almost had more body armor on um, as I was going around in, in business than I yeah. did going around in war zones, and that that shocked me slightly. Um, however, what I've also found is that there are some exceptional people out there. Um, and, and when I left the steel industry and set up my, uh, my own um, security uh, consultancy and, and, and marketing business before I fell into journalism, um, you know, I, I came across some absolutely exceptionally dedicated individuals who you know, helped me um, learn my new trade, um, who helped me develop, um, who uh, you know, helped, helped push me forward. So it, it's, it's, the, the biggest bit of advice is if I haven't just contradicted myself and everything I've said in the last couple of minutes is, is it's a different environment. Um, go in yeah. with your eyes open. It's exciting. There's lots of opportunities. It's not the same as the military. And um, you have to realize that uh, within it, uh, you have to look after yourself. There's no one else looking out for you as you go through things. Um, and just, just be who you are. Don't try and pretend to be something um, that, that you're not. I see, I see a lot of military people that um, come out and they try to be something different because they've done lots of courses, they've done lots of qualifications, they try to say they're exceptional at this and exceptional at that, and they've got hundreds of certificates and letters after their names and everything else, but they've got no practical experience. So they, yeah. they don't know what they're doing. And that, that stands out very quickly indeed. So you know, the, 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 the other biggest tip is be humble um, and learn from people and, and don't be afraid to... Um, uh, you know, to learn from those that in the military you would say are um, at, at a lower level than you. Um, I've learned more from um, a large number of my junior non-commissioned officers and my, uh, my uh, uh, senior non-commissioned officers uh, than I have done from um, anyone that was more uh, at, at my level or more senior than me when I was in the military. So, yeah. so it's, 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 I, I didn't find it a difficult transition, but that's because I was having other difficulties that focused gotcha. my mind. <laughs> So let's let's turn our intelligence lens to the tragedy that just occurred on London Bridge. Yeah. And what I found interesting is this was the first time that a tragedy had occurred that the rhetoric of we need encryption back doors wasn't rolled out. Yep. As you'll recall, after Manchester and after the previous London Bridge, there was some member of parliament that can continue to press for encryption backdoors. Yep. Do you think the encryption backdoor in the UK issue is, is a dead issue now, or do you feel it's just a quiet issue because of the current election climate? I don't think it's quiet because of the current election climate, uh, but I don't think it's a dead issue at all. Um, I think um, it is something that is going to come up more and more and more and more um, uh, because you know, the government agencies are... Um, having real difficulties, and, and they, they see this naively as a, as a solution, and for some reason or other think that just because the government agencies, that's, um, you know, if, they, if they propose to push it and get away with it. Of course, encryption backdoors exist in Russia, they exist mm -hmm. in China, they, they exist in all, you know, all of the oppressed states that are out there, so, go, so governments can, can sit and look at things, but that doesn't make it appropriate for, for us to do that. Um, the, the London Bridge attack, um, you know, the individual... Uh, and, and it's early days, and it's subject, still subject to police investigation. The, 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 it looks as if the individual was a lone wolf, was self-motivated. Um, and interestingly, um, at the time, you know, the, the, the couple of weeks beforehand, we had um, the so-called ISIS um, and Al-Qaeda um, uh, uh, encrypted communications on Telegram taken down by 
Um, you're a full, you're a pole, yeah. I I watched that with great uh, interest. Well, the, the 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 most interesting thing about that is that um, uh, ISIS and um, uh, Al Qaeda executed a perfect business continuity plan, and yeah. they ha and they have reopened um, the communication sites on uh, a number of other different end-to-end um, -end encrypted platforms, uh, which are even harder for the intelligence services to penetrate. So I think as as that comes more and more and if more attacks happen, and unfortunately, I think that's an inevitability, not um, uh, something that uh, isn't going to happen. Uh, it, as, as more attacks happen, then I think the cry to uh, try and force some form of backdoor is, is going to grow more and more. But I don't mm -hmm. think any Western government's going to be powerful enough to achieve that. Right. Um, but there's, there's, two, there's two elements of, of, of thought in there. You know, are, are they putting it out as a cry to try and keep it in uh, the public domain um, to cover the fact uh, because they actually have a genuine need to get in or are they doing it to try and cover the fact that they've already got backdoors into a lot of these systems um, <laughs> yes and, exactly and, and they're, are listening away as it is we're you know, going you, to ask for something that we already have so that people think we don't have it correct um you know you look, <laughs> yeah. you, look, you, look you look at you look at tor and every, everyone yeah. jumps up and down and, and says you know as, as we're accessing the the, the uh, dark web and all the rest of tor is the only way to get in all this tor was invented by u.s naval intelligence that's right you're not, you're not, you, you, nobody could convince me that um, an organization that has developed something has not got a method of um, having a little look at what goes on in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the background. Well, when you do have the resources of, uh, of the United States, certainly, and you understand a little bit about the, the architecture of, of TOR, the vulnerability being in control of the end, uh, the exit relays, it's conceivable that a nation may be able to establish enough exit relays um, uh, under their control to essentially try and reassemble a session. So th th it's theoretical. I don't think the attacks have actually taken place. But again, if such capability existed, why would you want to reveal it to, to the bad actors? Right? <coughs> Correct. And, and there's capability being developed all of the time. There's controversy yeah. at the moment in the run-up to the UK general election because um, they're saying that the uh, documents that were released by the leader of the opposition <laughs> um, talking about trade talks between the UK and the US um, over the National Health Service. Right. Uh, those, those being released by the Russians um, to the to the Labour Party or Russian connections to get to get them out in the first place, mm -hmm. and, and it ties in with you know, Russian hacking, Russian influence in all of all of the different um, uh, uh, elections. But it's it's wider than that. It's it's uh, it, it's Russian, Chinese, and, and other influence that there is around the world. You know, the, a few years ago we had the the Sony attack. Yeah, um, and the, um, you know, the Americans were very quick to turn around and blame the North Koreans. That's right. It, I, I, I find it fascinating. You know, North Korea, when you look at it, we've, we've got a country where um, they can't send, uh, they don't send anyone overseas to study at any of our universities about modern technology and about how everything works. Internet doesn't exist. Computers don't exist routinely within the society. Where are they getting people with all of this technical knowledge to be able to um, uh, understand how modern scripts are working, how modern communications networks are working, and um, to provide uh, you know, to develop these hacking teams that can get past anything uh, that you know, our big companies have got with very sophisticated um, uh, protection mechanisms in place. Um, I, there's one question to throw out there. The second question is, um, how is North Korea connected to the internet and to the wider world? Um, yeah. And that, and that was slightly easier to answer. There are two internet pipes um, that go into North Korea. There's a relatively small one that's been there for a number of years, and that's provided by China. Um, there, there's a second one, um, and about three years ago, um, the, uh, a second pipe was put into North Korea uh, by uh, a company called um, Trans Telecom. Okay. Trans Telecom is a Russian telecommunications company that is um, part of uh, the Russian um, National R um, uh, Railway Organization, and, and it's they, they uh, uh, wholly owned by the Kremlin, um, and you know they it's quite normal that um, telecoms companies uh, are, are part of uh, railway companies because the old traditional phone lines used to follow right. the rail yeah. lines from Russia. But you have to ask uh, why the Russians put such a big 
pipeline in. And, and, and if you look at the timing, it was also very interesting where whenever um, Kim Jong-un's um, uh, missile tests were failing nine times out of 10 in very short range missiles as they, as they blew up on the, on the pad or uh, yeah. didn't fly very far, to within um, several months after that, um, he had very long range missiles that were being successful nine times out of 10. Right. Um, and, and you then have to look at you know, what, what's, what's the wider geopolitics that's going on here. Mm -hmm. and for, for, so both Russia and China control the internet pipe and control all the internet traffic going in and out of North Korea. Hmm, okay. Um, and North Korea gets blamed for lots of these attacks that are out there. You know, we, we've, we've got this um, na naughty schoolboy, unfortunately, with nuclear weapons and Kim Jong-un, but um, he's, he's um, a very good, plausibly deniable outlet for other um, nation state activity. So if, if the Russians and the Chinese wanted to do something, but blame blame the boy in the naughty step, um, they, they can always get um, the blame put in North Korea quite easily. Absolutely. And, like and we, ha we have to recognize that's, you know, that that's, that's a, a strong possibility. And it, it's a very strong possibility. I mean, it, recently we saw APT-28 Turla subject or, or hijack infrastructure attributed to Iranian cyber operatives. Yep. So, you know, not without president. Uh, Philip, I just want to say it was my pleasure uh, having you on BeerCom 1. Um, any sort of last thoughts that you want to leave our audience with? I, I, I think this is absolutely fantastic. Um, and your hats off to you guys, uh, tinfoil hats off to you guys for, for having put this together. Um, and the charities that you are supporting are phenomenal. Um, you know, I just actively encourage everyone to um, get on there and, 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 and start to contribute as much as they possibly can. And good luck. Uh, the rest of the thank day. you. Thank you so much for that. And yes, we're doing quite well. Um, we just had a donation from Wendy Edwards a little while ago, and we're at 4,280 quid raised. So we're quickly approaching our 5,000 um, quid goal. Our uh, 5,000 would be the halfway point. Uh, we have a goal of 10,000. So thank you so much Fantastic. for your time. My and, pleasure. Uh, truly appreciate talking to you. Fascinating as usual. And uh, look forward to many more of your comments in uh, in Forbes and and following your work uh, as a journalist. Thank you. Cheers. Have a good day, folks. All right.